bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord, so much for bringing us here this Sabbath day. We thank you for the beauty that we can find even on a cold day like this because the sun is out. We ask you, Lord, that you please enter into our hearts and prepare us to receive your word today. In Christ's name. scripture reading is 2 Corinthians 6 17. Therefore come out from among them and be separate says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Good morning church. Good morning. Good morning. Today's offering is for Texas Vision. The Christian's GPS. A large Frederick, Maryland, Seventh-day Adventist church sits beautifully and imposingly along Interstate 70. Unfortunately, out-of-town visitors to the church are often challenged by what seems to be a confusing array of exits and streets. On a certain Sabbath, long before GPS and cell phones, a guest speaker was approaching the church and could not figure out how to get there, even though he could see the church. He tried his, this exit and that exit, and nothing seemed to work. Finally, in total frustration and running out of time, he pulled over to the shoulder of the interstate, parked his car, and trudged through the snow up the hill to the church. Did you know that there is a GPS that gives directions to our lives? It's called God's plan of stewardship. And it really, re it really works. Millions of Christians have testified of blessings from their faithfulness and tithes and offerings, as well as other forms of stewardship as time, talents, and care of God's earth, etc. On this second Sabbath day of 2018, it is still not too late to start the new year right. Let's determine to be faithful to God as we embark on this 12-month journey with him. God promises to open up for you the windows of heaven, Malachi 3.10. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. And Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity to give back to you even just a small portion of what is truly yours in our tithes and offerings today. Lord, we ask that you multiply these offerings, make them bountiful for the many needs of Texas Vision such as evangelism, summer camps, and building projects. And Lord, we ask this in the loving name of Jesus Christ, our Creator and Savior. Amen. Time for a children's offering. And uh, Aubrey is going to hold the little lamb's pouch. I, I'm sorry, Adriana. And children, when you're through with your collection, please have a seat over here. And Scott Stomberg will have a seat. Ah, oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. We're going to delay that. So we're going to collect the children's story. For, yeah, we'll do the children's offering. Okay. We'll make sure the children stay, stay and get their part. I'm going to have to get that pouch for you in just a minute. Uh, let me make a, a correction here. We're going to have, we're going to allow the children to, to have their collection now, but the story will be delayed until we uh, uh, exit for foot washing.
All right. Once again, happy Sabbath, church family. Oh, you're not convincing. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. Amen. We need to be joyful and happy to be in God's home. And that's what the first song is about, the idea of joy and being glad that he came to just give us eternal life. And if we're not happy about that, I don't know what on earth can make us happy. So I pray that we all join together sitting down to, so that God can hear our praises. joyful to be in God's home. Amen. 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 It's Sabbath, and it's a great reminder to know that he died for us, and not only did he die, he rose again, and now we have that opportunity to be with him very soon. And going on to the next song, I invite you, still sitting down, we're going to sing Anywhere with Jesus, hymn 508, all three verses.
to please stand with all of us and we're going to sing hymn 314 and we're going to sing four verses. <clears throat> Thank you very much to our praise team. Thank you, Carolina and Ken and Beth and Amber, and uh, the silent partner, Lydia, um, doing a very important job there. I know that we have at least one visitor, maybe more today. We want to inform you that we are going to be having a potluck today, a, a lunch this afternoon with our brothers and sisters. We invite you to join us. Uh, it's a free lunch. Um, you know, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch, so there is actually an opportunity cost. You, you have to forego going home and not being with your brothers and sisters on Sabbath, so I guess that's the cost of today's lunch. Um, in exchange, you get to be here and enjoy some great food with great company. Um, 
it's time for us to come together and to say a few words to our Lord and thank him for what he's done to us and what he's done for us this week. So if you have anything in your hearts that you want to lift up, I invite you to come together with me here in the middle, um, or you can kneel where you are, but let's seek the Lord together in prayer. We thank you, Lord, so much that you have given us the freedom and the privilege to freely come together with our brothers and sisters and worship you, Lord. We thank you for the Sabbath that you give us every week. Just when it seems like we can't take anything of more of what life has to throw at us, we get this, this opportunity to lay down our burdens and spend the day with you, Lord. We ask that you please help us to remember to always treasure that. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices that you've made for us for sending your son your only child, to be the person who can redeem us because he is also the person who created us. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given to us that gives us the opportunity to go about our lives without worrying about what are we going to do next? Where is our next meal coming from? Where are we going to lay down our heads and be safe for the night? How are we going to provide for our children? Lord, everything that we have, we have you to thank, and we thank you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that as we begin a new year, that you will cleanse us and redeem us and help us to be rededicated to your purpose for us here in this world, to sharing the gospel, to share your love with all those that we meet. In everything we do, the big things and little things, there's always an opportunity, Lord, and we ask you to help us to remind us of that and to give us the courage to follow that at all times. Lord, I thank you so much for the church family that we have here for our brothers and sisters. And we ask you, Lord, that any time that a visitor walks through these doors, that they can see that and that they can have a desire to become part of that because we do desire for them to join us. And we just want to share your love with them, Lord. So always help us, Lord, to reach out to a new face. Even if it turns out that somebody that's been here for a while and we just didn't recognize them, please help us to make that, that reach out. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. In Christ's name, amen. amen.
Can you guys hear me? Cool. Sometimes I have, I have a hard time hearing myself, so I never know. But that was really awesome. Thank you for that. You know, that reminded me so much of uh, me growing up when I, when I was little, I grew up playing violin in the church. Um, so it just brought back all those memories of doing that. First of all, I have to you're probably, I have, to, I have to say this, you're probably wondering two things. First of all, where I've been, um, and I'll get to that. Second of all, do I wear socks? And yes, I do, I always wear socks. You can just never see them. Um, I get asked that pretty much every Sabbath. So just to clarify, I'm always wearing socks. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. But... Uh, Actually, where I've been, I've been out for almost three weeks now. It's been going by really fast. But this is where I've been, let me tell you. Um, first, I went to go see my family for Christmas, right? Spend time with my fiance, spend time with my family. Hopefully, this doesn't fall. Um, and then from there, the day after Christmas, we actually went out with some youth to GYC in Phoenix, Arizona. We had an amazing time where we were waking up at like 5 o'clock in the morning to go pray for an hour. Um, we were listening to sermons and having different sessions and eating a bunch of Adventist food. It was fantastic. And from there, as we were driving back from... Phoenix, we stopped in El Paso for New Year's, and that's where we celebrated New Year's. We went to IHOP, in case you were wondering. I actually, January 1st, that morning, I woke up and I had to go to the ER. Um, I was not doing so well, and from there, they gave me a couple shots, a few antibiotics, sent me home like everything was good. I come back. Everything's not so good. So I had to rush back to Dallas for emergency surgery. And that's where I've been. So now I'm good, in case, you're, in case you're wondering. And I'm here. So things are good. The other thing I have to do is confess that I gave the wrong scripture reading. Even though what's on the bulletin is great. Any part of scripture is great. But it's the wrong one. So I'm going to read the right one to you. And it comes from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 14 through 17, but I'm going to skip chapter 16 because I'm picky like that. It starts, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Skipping to verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Amen. New year, new me, right? We're continuing with our series uh, called Healing Hearts. Uh, and today, we're talking about having a paradigm shift. By the way, how's your resolutions going? Anybody still... Fighting strong? No? I don't know if you can tell I've lost some pounds, but uh, I've had a head start. I've been working on it for a couple months. So God is good. You know the winning's coming up. That's why. Um, but let's, let's pray before, before we get started. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this new year. Uh, even though for me it's had a little rocky start, um, starting it in the hospital and with surgery. God, I know it's a good year. Um, and I know that you're present here with us right now. Uh, so just speak to us. Help us to learn and understand and experience you today. I ask in your name, amen. So I'm going to I'm gonna try to go through this kind of quick because we have communion. I don't want to take up your whole afternoon. 
Um, but let me ask you a question. Have you guys ever felt frustrated? Yes? Okay, some of you laugh. I'm glad. Because I've had one of the most frustrating experiences to date. Where do I start? Where I live. In my apartment, which I really like, they give you a designated parking spot. Not bad, right? You know it's there. It's always going to be there for you. But here's the issue. You get one. So one weekend, I had a friend come over. I'm trying to be a good friend, I tell them, like, hey, you know what? You can have my parking spot while you're here. I'll look for one. So good friend that I am, I do that. One day, we get home kind of late. And I tell my friend, don't worry about it. You take the parking spot. I'll look for one. So they take the parking spot, and I'm looking for another place. Now, granted, there was this place where we used to park that had recently been painted with a red line. No parking. I could not find a spot. So I'm, I'm getting a little frustrated. I'm driving around. I'm starting to go to the other side of the apartment complex, and I'm not seeing a single parking spot. Not one. So I, I start thinking and contemplating my options, and I'm like, okay, I could go to Randall's down the street and park my car there, but that's kind of ridiculous, let's be honest. Um, and so I'm just going to park on the red line and pray that my car's here tomorrow. And that's what I did. Now, don't do this. Okay. So I did that. And lo and behold, I wake up in the morning and my car's still there. I say, thank you. No, it wasn't there, actually. My car was towed. My car was towed. And so I was like, okay. A little bit frustrated already. But I called the towing company. And yes, they have my car. Uh, and then I'm like, okay. Now I'm kind of, I need to go to the leasing office to figure this out because there was absolutely no parking, right? They should kind of do something about that. It's not really my fault. So I go to the leasing office, and I tell them, like, hey, you know, this is a situation. My car got towed. I, I parked on the red line. I get it, you know. But that was only because there was absolutely no parking, not one single spot. Is there anything you can do to help? And they were like, no, we get it. We're so sorry about that. But unfortunately, we can't do anything. And I said, I know you can't do anything. I'm so sorry. Let me speak to your manager. And so they said, OK, no problem. So they bring in the, the property manager, right? And I tell them the whole story again. And they're like, hey, we're so sorry. I, I totally understand. Um, in fact, you're not the only one. Four cars got towed last night. Um, so I'm like, oh, so it's an issue. OK, it's a situation. So you get me. You understand, like, th there's something going on that you have to sort of fix. And uh, here I am. Can you fix it? And they're like, yeah, unfortunately, we can't do anything about it. You know, we're trying to work out a solution. I'm like, come on. OK, so who do I need to talk to? They said, you can try to talk to the corporate office. I'm like, I'll do that. So they're like, here's the website. Go. Um, you can get in contact with our corporate office. So they give me the website. I go, I look up the website, and there's no phone number. All I can do is send them a little message. I'm getting really frustrated at this point, because I'm like, I want to talk to somebody. I want to let them know how I feel. I'm frustrated. So I sent them a little message, and they're not answering. Finally, I tell Maddie, and she's like, hey, let me see if I can maybe find their corporate office number, or maybe if I call and ask. And, and she gets the number. Um, so now I'm talking to corporate office, and they're like, hey, let me give you a call back. So they take about a day, give me a call back. And this time, by this time, I needed my car. So I'm like paying out of pocket to get my car back. And I'm like, you guys need to reimburse me or something. Like, this is not OK for you to know that there's an issue, and you're not doing anything about it. Um, and finally, after some days of going back and forth, they said, look, we're not doing this to anybody else but we'll, we'll pay for half of your towing. I was like, I guess that's better than nothing, right? So I was like, OK. They said, we're going to credit it to your account, so that way you don't even have to worry about it. I said, thank you. Next month, 
nothing credited to my account. I'm like, okay, so now there's an issue again. So I go talk to the leasing office. They said, we're sorry, we're gonna do it for next month. Again, next month doesn't happen. Next month doesn't happen. Not until this month that they finally credited to my account. I was like, thank you, God. I'm so tired, I'm so over this. I'm so frustrated. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this type of frustration or if any of you guys can relate where I'm just kind of sick of it and I'm like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. But I think that if we're being honest with ourselves, we have sort of all felt this type of frustration in one way or another, especially for those of us that have been Christian for a while, right? When we read this passage that I just read, where Paul says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. We, we believe it, and we get baptized, and we tell ourselves, okay, I got a new life. Only to realize there's much of the old life still there. You know, I have to go back to the same job, same school. I still have to pay the same bills. You know, I have to go back to the same wife. She doesn't look any more newer than I do. I have to go back to the same kids who are still jerks or the same parents who still don't understand me. Same friends with the same jokes, same problems, and worst of all, I'm still dealing with the same bad habits. I still have the same ten temptations, and I'm still dealing with the same stuff. And I don't know about you, but I don't feel any new, very new. And so we ask ourselves, what happened? Right? What happened? I thought I was supposed to be new. I thought I kind of go into the waters, come out, and I'm a new being. What happened? It's like, did God, we, we ask ourselves, like, God, did, did you miss it? Did you forget that I moved? Forwarding address, I can give it to you in case you need it. But, but we, we tell ourselves what's going on. You know, we read this and say, like, Paul, this sounds nice. You know, I, I really dig this metaphor that you're going for, but I need something practical, man. Like, I need something that's going to help me Monday at work. You see, when Paul wrote this, he was writing to uh, the Corinthian church, right? Obviously, the church in Corinth. Corinthians is found in Corinthians. Okay. So... The Corinthians, Corinth, was kind of like Vegas if you mix it with something that's a lot worse than Vegas. I don't know what to relate it to. Corinth, there was a term to Corinthianize. I'm glad I said that correctly. To Corinthianize referred to a life of immorality when somebody was used the term to Corinthianize, it was in, in reference to a life of immorality. When somebody was called a Corinthian girl, they were essentially referring to either the job that they held or the type of person you don't want to date. In, in fact, the, the prostitute, I think it was the, the prostitute, the temple of Aphrodite was known for having about a thousand prostitutes in there, in Corinth. And there was a famous play that was written in Greece um, called C Corinthian, the Corinthian, I think, and it was about a drunkard. So this kind of gives you an idea of the population and culture of the Corinthian population, the city, the city of Corinth. 
And so this was sort of like the city that surrounded the Corinthian church. And so Paul tells these people, therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And it's like, okay, Paul, that's awesome. That's cool. But I still live in Corinth. Are you going to help me? Is that going to be helpful to me in Corinth right now? You see, when Paul says this, he's talking about position more than he's talking about practice. He's talking about position more than he's talking about practice. The position that, Christ, that, that Paul is talking about is in Christ, right? If anybody is in Christ, it's actually one of Paul's favorite phrases. He uses it 73 times in his letters. It's his favorite phrase to describe any believer in Christ. He says, we are in Christ, you are in Christ, in Christ, he uses the term in Christ over and over again. And it speaks to the position that we receive in the moment that we believe. Once again, Paul is referring to position rather than daily practice. And it's important to understand this because this is how our, our world works. Our world says that, that practice determines position. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently bad about that. It's just the world that we live in, right? If you go to school, your practice will determine the type of job you will get in the future. Your practice will determine your position. So if you do well in school, you will get a good job. This applies to basically anything you do. In other words, it's what you do determines who you are, right? If you're smart, if you do well in school, you're smart. If, if you have a great job and you make a lot of money, you're called successful. What you do determines who you are. Practice determines position. So, when Paul says, you are now in Christ, the old has passed, the new has come, God, in the words of Paul, is letting us know that there's a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, a shift in the pattern, a shift in paradigm, where now position determines my practice. Where now who I am determines what I do. You see, if I am in Christ now, he has made me new, right? So he has, gave me, he has given me a new way of thinking. If I am in Christ, he gives me a different way of living. He gives me a different way of being. If I am in Christ, I don't need to worry anymore. I don't need to stress anymore. I don't need the insecurities that I had anymore. Because now I am in Christ. And there's nothing that I can do to add to what he's given me. And there's nothing that I can do to take away from what he's given me. The moment that I accept Jesus... I am in Christ, and I have everything I need. So when, when God looks at me, he doesn't see me anymore. He sees Jesus, right? So in the moment that I accept Jesus, I am in Christ. I, I'm as righteous as I need to be, right? I'm as holy as I need to be. I'm as accepted as I could ever be, and I'm as loved as I ever want to be. A am I perfect? Not yet. But God's working on that. But my position now is in Christ. 
However, there's some of us that, you know, are still working really hard, thinking that maybe if I just keep on working, maybe if I just keep on doing good stuff, maybe if I just keep on reading my Bible and my devotions, and maybe if I just keep on giving, and, and maybe if I just keep on sending my kids to church school, maybe if I just keep on helping others, maybe if I just keep on doing and doing and doing, then maybe God will bless me, and maybe I can get the wife that I want, maybe I can get the life that I want, maybe I can get the promotion that I want, maybe he will give me the job that I want, maybe he will give me the things that I want, and, and we just... I'm just going to keep on practicing here so that I can get the position that I want. The answer is no. That's not how it works. Practice does not determine position when it comes to God. The old has passed, the new has come. None of the things that I mentioned are inherently wrong. In fact, all of those things are good. But when we start to try to let practice determine position, we have the wrong way of thinking. Because now I am in Christ. You are in Christ. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that he has done. Communion, which we're about to do. Every time we do communion, we are declaring that we are in Christ. That we are in Christ. That we are accepting him. I had no part of the sacrifice. You had no part of the sacrifice. I had no part in the work. And you had no part in the work. But we are still in Christ. But this is where it gets tough because although I accept my position as being in Christ and I, I, I understand that's who I am, I recognize that my practice, let's be honest, right? My practice doesn't always reflect my position. My practice seems kind of inconsistent. My practice mostly reflects me instead of reflecting God. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating. But Paul shares in our struggle too. He says in Romans in Romans chapter 7, he says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I don't know if you felt the same frustration that I do. But the problem is this. That we let our sin, we let our inconsistent practice, we let... All of that overshadow our position in Christ. You know, we, we start to think that as my position, that our position as, is as inconsistent as my practice. We start to think that uh, as my practice goes, then his love goes. That as, as my practice goes, his acceptance goes. That as my practice goes, his righteousness goes. And we let that become the focus. We let that seep into our beliefs. And, and so I keep on trying to work on myself. I keep on trying to work on my practice. And I start focusing on my practice and soon enough, it all becomes about me. 
it all becomes about me. And if we're not careful, we shift our whole focus to ourselves. And we shift our whole church focus to ourselves. We go from being in Christ to in me. Where our focus goes, we go. So position determines practice. Where I stand, that determines what I do. Who I am determines how I live. Position determines practice. And I choose to live in Christ. And I choose to focus on Jesus. And if we are in Christ, that changes how we act. It changes what we do. If I am in Christ, it changes everything about me. If I am in Christ, it changes how I talk. Right? If I am in Christ, it changes the jokes that I make. If I am in Christ, it changes how I use my time, how I use my money, which friends I surround myself with, and what I watch and what I do with my spare time. And everything about me, little by little, God starts to change to make me the, the person that he wants me to be, the person that he has called me to be. But the thing is this, it's not by my own efforts. Yes, it does take work sometimes, but it's not, you're not going to change yourself by trying hard. When I am in Christ, and this is what I want you to get. When I am in Christ, Christ is in me. That's just beautiful. When I am in Christ, Christ is in me. And so if I am in Christ, he's the one that can change my practice. But my practice will never change my position. My practice will never change who I am. My practice will never get me to where I want to be. Where I stand can determine where I walk, but where I walk will never determine where I stand. Here's the truth. I'm going to finish with this. Truth is, I still struggle with sin. Just like you struggle with yours and Paul struggled with his. But we cannot let our frustration, our problems, our stress, our situations to eclipse and make us forget that we are in Christ. So I want to be practical, because this is not just nice theory. Next time that you find yourself in a situation, whether it's an ethical dilemma at work, or you're tempted, or you recognize that I'm about to take a step that I don't want to take. I want you to do this out loud, vocally, audibly. Remind yourself, declare it over your life. I am in Christ. I am the righteousness of Christ. That's who I am, and that will determine what I do. Let's pray.
Father, what can we say to even start to thank you for the endless grace that you show us? That we can be considered righteous, that we can be considered to be in Christ, hidden in Christ, when we have done nothing to deserve it. But you give it to us, God, because you love us. And we want to be with you because we love you too. And we just want to be together. And I know sometimes the things that we do don't always reflect that, but we want to change that. So remind us, remind us that that you have set us free and we are free indeed. Remind us that, that what you say is not just good talk, but it helps us every day. Remind us that we are in Christ. Lord, we love you. We can't wait to see you. Help us to experience you in every day, every moment of our life. And to accept you as we remember today in our communion service. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, um, as it is our tradition in the communion service, I invite you guys to take part of foot washing. And we have uh, three rooms. We have one here, one here, and one over here. This one's going to be for gentlemen only. Then we have one for the couples, and we have one for the ladies over here. Um, so during this time, we're going to have children's story. So children, you will get your children's story. Um, but if you want to participate in the foot washing, we do invite you to go ahead and do that. Thank you guys very much, and we'll start with the communion service after the foot washing. If any of the kids want to come up front, we'll have children's story up here. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? All right, I want to tell you a, a little story. But first, I want to show you guys a few pictures, okay? Okay, I'll hold this around. Does anybody know what this is? 
All right, what is this? Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, this. Yes, this is a wolf. This is a timber wolf. All right, let me show you another picture of a timber wolf. Here's another picture. Yeah, that's the snow. Okay, I'm going to show you one more. Hold on. Look at this picture. Is that does that Lilith look mean? Oh, he's scrawling. You think he looks nice or mean? This one looks nice? <laughs> he's bearing a lot of teeth. Yeah. So what do you guys know about timber wolves? You know anything about it? where do they live? Yeah, they live in the northern part of the United States, Canada, Alaska. What else do you know about them? Mm, yes, they live where it gets a lot colder than here. How big do you think they get? They get up to about 180 pounds. How big is 180 pounds? Yeah. That's more than I weigh. That's like a full-grown adult person. Man. Mm, they're very, very big. How much do you think timber wolves eat? How much can they eat in one day? Yeah. They can eat about 20 pounds of meat in one day. 20 pounds. Uh-huh. 20 pounds of meat in one day. Mm -hmm. How strong do you think their mouths are? How hard can they bite? Which do you th think bites harder, a tiger or a timber wolf? A tiger? Are you sure? A timber wolf bites with 1,200 pounds of force. A tiger bites with 950 Timberwolves have stronger jaws than tigers. Now I'm going to show you some other pictures. What's this? This is another timber wolf. What's different about this picture? Does he look nicer? Okay, let's look at another picture. Here's another picture of a timber wolf. Yeah. All right, let's look at let's look at another one. Here's another full picture of him. He was pretty big. Yeah, look at how look at this fur. Now, here's a picture of him when he was a baby. Who's that person? I'm going to tell you in just a second. Yeah. So what's different about this timber wolf other than the nice pictures? This timber wolf was my timber wolf. And I raised him from when he was just a little puppy. About 20 years ago, back when I was in college. His name was Zeus. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture, a picture of him when he was just a little itty bitty puppy. And that's me. I know I look different. I was a lot younger than 20 years ago. <laughs> okay, so remember what I told you about the timber wolves in the wild? They eat 20 pounds of meat in a day. They can bite with 1,200 pounds of strength. They live where it's cold. And a lot of people think of timber wolves as really mean. When I was a boy, the timber wolves would go into my grandparents' cow farm and their pastures and kill all sorts of cattle. We'd have huge problems with lots of timber wolves in northern Minnesota. When I got Zeus, he was just a little puppy, and I raised him while I was in college. And he grew up around lots and lots of kids and young people and everything else. And he was not at all like that. He is super kind and sweet, 
Do you know what one of his favorite foods was? Pizza. Yes, pizza. You know this, Hendrix. He loved pizza. Do you know where he liked to sleep? He used to sleep on the bed just like a person. He would crawl up there, stretch out, put his head on the pillow, stretch down the length of the whole bed, because he pretty much took up the whole bed because he was huge, and sleep like a person. And that's where he liked to sleep. You guys know who Zachary is? Do you know who Zachary is? My brother Zachary? Yeah. When Zachary was a little boy, he used to ride Zeus like a horse. He rode him around like a horse. And one day, Zachary was down in the yard, and Zeus was up on a porch that was way up in the air on a log house. And Zachary started screaming and crying. He was getting attacked by a huge turkey. A tom turkey attacked him when he was just a little tiny boy. And my dad heard, and he came running, and as he looked out the door, he saw Zeus jumping off that tall deck. He hit the ground, and in just a couple seconds, well, Thanksgiving came early for the turkey. <laughs> and Zeus protected Zachary. Zeus loved kids. He loved to ride around in the car with me. I would take him over to the lake when there was still, like, in the spring or the fall when the ice was thin on the edge. And he used to love to run and jump and break through the ice and splash around in the cold water. <laughs> for real. He loved the snow. He loved to lay out in the cold. And he was super loving to everybody. When we used to take him to the vet, he'd have to get his shots. How many of you guys like shots? Do you like getting shots when you go to the doctor? <laughs> That's not the same thing, no. But you know how you know what Zeus was like? And the vet said he'd never seen a dog that was such a wimp. He said as soon as he pulled out his, the needle and the syringe, before he even got close to him, he would start whining and howling. He'd be like, Ooh, and he'd just go like crazy before the vet even gave him the shot. And he says, I have never seen such a big dog that's such a wimp, and he's supposed to be a timber wolf. Well, there's a couple of lessons to this story that I wanted to share with you guys. There's a verse found in 1 Samuel 16, 7. And it says, Do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see, a ma see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So remember when I showed you all those pictures of timber wolves and they looked mean and they were growling? If you didn't know any difference and you saw Zeus running through the woods, you might think that's what he is. But that's not what he was like in his heart. He had a kind and loving heart. So we need to remember that when we look at other people, that we never judge them by what they look like or by what others say, that we always get to know them because remember that God is looking at their heart. Also, God changes hearts, and we find that in Philippians 1, 6. And it says, being confident of, his ver of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means that just like Zeus, because he was raised different and was taught different and his heart was changed, Jesus will also change your heart. So if there's things in your heart that you want him to change, just ask him. He'll change your heart. Would anybody like to have prayer for us today? Nobody feeling brave? Okay, I'll have prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the lessons that you provide us by the little things in our life. And we ask that you would help us remember not to look at others by their outward appearance and to always trust that you are working to change our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
glad to see each of you here, that you will celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. What an awesome event that was, and I just pray that the Holy Spirit will work in your heart what was working in the life and the heart of Christ um, 2,000 years ago when he celebrated what he knew to be the last time with his disciples before he would be crucified and then resurrected and go back to heaven. Matthias is going to read the passages for the emblems, and then Ray will have prayer for those emblems. And as we pray, just invite you to bow your heads as we kneel here. From Matthew chapter 26, and I'm going to read verses 26 through 29. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Please bow your, please bow your heads and join us in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Gracious God, we humbly bow before you in recognition of your sacrifice and the things you ask us to do in your honor. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to join us, to educate us, and to impart in us the significance of this sermon. Lord, I ask you for forgiveness. I pray that you will find all of us participating in this sermon today worthy of that participation. For you warned us against participating unworthily. Thus, Lord, I thank you for finding us worthy and for choosing us as your own. But Lord, you also promised that the next time you drink and eat of this bread, it will be with us in your kingdom heaven. I pray, Lord, that you will find each one present here today at that ceremony. And I thank you for guarding us until that day and for keeping us in your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. book of Revelation says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. And 
if it wasn't for the blood of the lamb, they would have no testimony. So I invite you now to just take a moment to share. We've spent the month of December sharing some more in-depth testimonies from the front. And we're going to continue to do that. We're also going to continue to do that in video form in the upcoming year, this year. Um, but I encourage you to just share a little bit. If you've got a little, just a little something, no matter how small or how minor, how the blood of the Lamb has given you a testimony. And also, um, if there is anyone who needs a gluten-free wafer, we have got one right here. So please just raise your hand and uh, um, we'll get this to you. I think we got I think we got a hand up right here, Bruce. Yes. I just want to praise God for his uh, continual guidance uh, in my life, um, just constantly showing me uh, the things I need to know, and it's, it's always just at the right timing, just whenever I feel like I don't know my way, he always comes and just impresses me in the right moment and just reminds me that as long as I'm focused on him, he will show me, and I don't have to worry if I have the strength, if I have the courage, if I have... Uh, the wisdom, but he, he, he will do all that for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I would like to thank God because of the awesome way that he answered our prayers in December. My daughter is a teacher in Hinsdale Academy. She has two little dogs, and she couldn't find nobody to take care of them. And um, uh, it was two weeks already in December. And uh, we pray, and we pray, and I told her, our God is the God of impossibility. He makes it possible, everything. So two weeks in December, she finds somebody to take care of her little dogs, and she found a fair that was cheap of the regular price. So I praise God with all my heart because he answered our prayer and because he's a mighty God. He's awesome God. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Two thousand seventeen was a typical Podine year and God in his mercy got us through it. Uh, some personal things happened that was heart wrenching, some physical things occurred, but through it all we can praise Jesus because we're still family. We still have our church family and friends. And uh, there's some things a little uncertain in the future, but you're not, not worried about it because we do serve an awesome God. And thank you guys for your friendship. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else?
Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Yes, we're glad you're here. Do we still have the mic? If not, you taking this one. Happy Sabbath, Truth Family. I want to praise God uh, for the good. His time is always perfect. Um, I was speaking to a friend of ours how, you know, we get up, you get up, you have breakfast, you go to work, you go do your things, and you don't think, we don't think about our health. Um, and in my profession, it's hard to take time off. Well, last week, we finally took a few days off with the family. We, we went away and with my grandparents, uh, with my parents, their grandparents. And last Friday and Sabbath, I really felt sick and ill, and I had a chills, etc. But in the midst of that, I praise God because he allowed me to be ill on vacation as opposed to when I'm needed here. So praise God for his, uh, his provision and his perfect timing. Yeah, probably some would wonder whether that's perfect timing, though, Farley, but understand. And, you know, you, it's seeing you, though, just reminds me. Um, just want to share with, with you to remember in prayer as well our, our Little Adventurers Club. They are at the Keene Spanish Church today. And uh, they, are, they are partaking in the Bible Bowl, which is a, a quiz. They, they finished first. I remember I announced they finished first in the Houston Bay Area uh, competition. And so they went on to the conference. So it's the, the teams or the clubs, I should say, from the different areas of the conference there today. So just remember them. Thank you so much for sharing, everybody. We really appreciate uh, you taking the opportunity to to share uh, that testimony of his word. And, you know, sometimes I do actually stop to take a moment to think about what was the atmosphere in that upper room because there's always an atmosphere. There's always kind of, and I don't know what you would use to describe it. I don't know that we really have a word in English. Is there a Spanish word that would describe that? You know, there's kind of an ambiance, and it's not just ambiance, it's more than that. It's kind of the, what's going through the room, the, the sense in people's hearts. And you think about, they just had the foot washing, Jesus washed their feet, and, and, and Judas is there with, with these dark, dark evils in his own heart. Um, but yet they're there in Jesus with a longing heart. I just always wonder, what was it, was it like? 
there as the disciples are there getting ready to partake of this. But Jesus told them, he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Eat ye all of it. Amen. You know, as I say, sometimes you wonder what that atmosphere was like. <coughs> because as the, as the dinner began, Jesus made the announcement that, hey, there's somebody here that's going to betray me. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, betray me. And so they're, they're kind of wondering, what, what, what's, what's this about? It doesn't really sink in. And then, of course, Judas, at some point in this process, gets up and leaves. But they still don't really, it doesn't sink in. Um, I can't imagine what it was like in the heart of Christ as he took that cup. And he said, you know what, this is a new covenant. It's a new covenant. In my blood, and this is the blood that I'm shedding for you. And because this is a new covenant, and it is my blood, I'm asking you to drink all of it. Amen. I want to invite you to pass your cups to the outside aisles, this aisle here and this aisle here. And actually those on the, on the very outside sections, you'll pass them in to this aisle. But to these two aisles is where the deacons will pick up these cups uh, as we conclude. Also, I want to invite you to be generous as you make a donation to the Good Samaritan Fund. There will be a deacon at each door to take the collection for the Good Samaritan Fund. Also, I want to tell you that, that there will... There's no benediction, so um, as we finish singing our closing song, as soon as we're done singing that song, we're done. So that's the end of the service at that point. But I want to invite you to stand now as we get ready to sing our closing song. and turn to hymn number one, 485 sing I must tell Jesus hymn number 485 
Jesus can help.